Hi, everyone. It's great to see you this morning or afternoon. I'm just kind of seeing all the attendees come in, giving them a second to join us. So if you just give them like about five more seconds before we get started. Amazing. We have over 100 attendees tuning in today. So excited to see you guys today. Um, everyone, we're excited to talk about a very interesting topic about the evolution of influencer marketing, where we'll be talking about how to leverage influencers and how these panelists measure success. As we are going along, if you have any questions that come to mind, we'd love to hear from you. You can drop those in the chat. And towards the end, I will definitely try to get to as many as possible to get those answered for you. My name is Carrie Links Cummins. I am a senior level communications and social media strategist and experience in enterprise level marketing companies, retail and nonprofit organizations. I currently am the director of managed services at Aspire IQ, where my team nearly works with 100 brands creating and implementing and refining influencer marketing programs, social media strategies, for 100 clients, as well as developing and executing their influencer partnerships, programs, and campaigns. I'd also love to introduce you to our fabulous guest today, starting with Kathleen Reidenbach. She is the Chief Commercial Officer at Kempton Hotels and Restaurants, where she is responsible for the development and execution of Kempton's global sales and marketing strategy, communications platforms, CSR, which is corporate social responsibility program and guest engagement approach to drive brand awareness, guest and employee loyalty and top line performance across the portfolio. Hi, Kathleen. Good to see you. Hi there. Hello. We also have Stephen Rummer, who is the Senior Vice President of Strategy and Creative at NBCU Universal's Creative Partnerships. Creative Partnership serves as NBCU's intern internal creative agency, overseeing the development and execution of multi-network, multi-platform integrated marketing, media, and content solutions for advertisers across all verticals, including entertainment, lifestyle, live programming, multicultural, com uh, Comcast Cable, and films and parks. Great to have you, Stephen. Great to be here. Wow, that's a mouthful, right? <laughs> My mouthful, but I definitely want people to know kind of about everybody's, you know, portfolio of what you guys have been doing. So I'm going to keep going here and then we're going to get to our awesome questions. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Zara is our next panelist. She is currently the global brand director of GE, where she oversees global marketing strategies, corporate brand architecture, content, media, and sponsorship. Zara has a proven track record in understanding how brand building can help drive long-term growth and build business and has a reputation for using creative and disruptive solutions to create real competitive advantage. Great to see you, Zara. Nice to be here. Thank you. No problem. We also have Eric Edge, who is the Senior Vice President of Marketing and Communications at Postmates. Prior to joining Postmates, Eric spent time at Pinterest as head of global marketing communications, where he focused his team around telling the Pinterest story globally and driving business growth. Before Pinterest, he served as the head of marketing at Facebook in Europe, the Middle East and Africa, leading regional marketing efforts across the world and launching the experimental marketing team for Facebook as head of experimental marketing upon his return to San Francisco. Hey, Eric, good to see you. Hey, thanks for having me. Good to see you. Good to see you too. And Guillaume Contevel is the currently the global head of digital marketing at MasterCard. Other positions that he has held at MasterCard includes overseeing the marketing in Western Europe and running media for Europe. Prior to this, Guillaume did a range of digital account management, <clears throat> excuse me, new business roles in various media agencies at WPP, IPG, and Publix. Good to see you, Guillaume. Good to see you. Whew, I think I got through it. I, I wanted to make sure we had all these. We have a lot of amazing panelists, a uh, good group here. Good to see all of you and, and really excited to dig in here um, about this topic of evolution of influencer marketing. So I, I wanna start off with our first question. I, I would love to get you know, an 
insight from each one of you throughout these questions. The first one I have top of mind is, you know, when and why did your brand start looking to influencers as a marketing outlet and really what made you consider this opportunity? Kathleen, we'll start with you. Sure. So Kimpton initially, when, when Bill Kimpton founded Kimpton Hotels, we were all about PR and word of mouth. We weren't allowed to do any advertising at all. At all. So things have kind of evolved, but we've always been pretty um, heavily invested and, and put a lot of effort towards word of mouth marketing and PR. And so it's just sort of a natural evolution for us to about 10 years ago, start to you know really sort of invest and think about influencers, partnerships, relationships with customers. And have found that through influencer marketing, it's just a great way for us to demonstrate sort of the, the aspirational nature of our brand. Our guests really love to sort of dip into these different experiences, try on the lifestyle, you know, at the Armory and in Bozeman or the Seafire in Grand Cayman. And so influencers have been a really powerful way for us to bring that to life. And people can kind of see um, sort of the look and feel and the vibe of the property and allows it to really kind of shine through. Yeah, and it gives a kind of an overarching story of their entire vacation. And sometimes we don't get to see the hotel part of that. And so it's an interesting thing to see their story and, and you know, their experience with your, your hotel group and, you know, how it kind of is a part of the overall vacation. Yeah, so I think rather like than a flat ad, it just, I just added, rather than a flat ad, you can see what it's like to sit, at, you know, sit at the bar and have a cocktail or do some of those things that you might experience on the stay. So it helps. Oh my gosh, I miss doing those types of things a lot. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Absolutely. Stephen, what about you? Uh, yeah, it's interesting. We, um, uh, being a entertainment media company, um, influencers are kind of part of the fabric of, of what we have and what we do. Um, we're in a position where we both uh, work with influencers that are established um, as well as create influencers from the ground up with the programming that we have on air. So. When you think about NBC Universal and what we do for clients is our job is to basically uh, democratize access to influencer talent for them to help them tell their brand story to our audiences. And so um, a few years ago, we set up what we call the talent room, which is run by my colleague Miguel Rodriguez um, to basically help to uh, organize when we get a brief from a client um, who's looking to uh, partner with us and have access to our talent as an influencer for their brand. Uh, we work very closely to match them up with the right set of influencers or the right specific influencer within NBC Universal. Um, what's really great about this and what's what's built into this uh, and why advertisers come to us because is because not only do we have access to all of these different levels of talent um, uh, to help tell these brand stories, but in addition to that, we are already vetting them for brand safety because they're going to be on our air. And so it's really important that the people that we work with at NBC Universal are are, are um, uh, good for brands and good for audiences both at the same time. Yeah, I'm really interested, you know, when we first started thinking about an influential person, it was an actress or an actor or someone on a TV show or movies. And so I'm really curious to see, you know, why did you then start to go into a different network of people beyond your immediate um, artists and, and actors? Yes, there's so many different versions of an influencer. And I think that the the thing that's most important when brands are working with influencers is authenticity and authenticity and uh, within uh, the content that they create, the content that they're a part of or how they talk to their fans or whatever else that might be. And uh, for us, the, the real growth area was not necessarily around giant talent like Jennifer Lopez. Like we, we know Jennifer Lopez is a huge influential um, actress, uh, uh, performer, musician. Uh, but it's also uh, looking at where are we developing new influencer talent. So if you think about uh, some of the programming that we have on air, like a Project Runway or a Top Chef, when fans watch those shows, uh, they are they are getting to know uh, different the different contestants along the way. And each of those different contestants have their own little mini fan universes that they're building up as as the show progresses. And so when you look at our talent and the growth area for that. Um, some of these chef testants, former contestants on Project Runway, some of the contributors that we bring uh, onto the Today Show, uh, all of those folks were both uh, getting a platform, giving a platform to on, on programming, but then also bringing them along uh, to partner with brands to tell those stories. 
Yeah, absolutely. When I think about entertainment, I think about community. I really do. That's how people connect to each other through a show or through like, a, you know, I can relate to that character or that character just completely makes me laugh all the time. Um, so yeah, it's definitely built around a community. It's great to hear how you've been fostering that. Eric, I'd love to hear a little bit more from you around, you know, how you started influencer marketing and, and kind of where you are now with Postmates. Yeah, sure. So Postmates is one of the leading on-demand delivery platforms in the U.S., but specifically when we think about influencer and why we lean into influencer so much, um, we're the number one platform in L.A. And so over the past nine years, as the, the platform has built up, we've, we've become the number one in L.A. And, and what that meant early on is we saw that studios, we saw that, you know, music houses, writers were starting to order Postmates in because it gave them access to their favorite restaurants within L.A., and not that LA is the center of, of, of everything influencer, but it very much is a place where culture in many ways begins and, and, and pop culture stems from when it comes to you know, music, uh, TV and, and such. And so we saw this happening organically in LA and to Stephen's point about authenticity, all of these people, these influencers, large and small are using Postmates in LA. So we said, hmm, this is something interesting because they're using it organically. We should lean into this more. We should lean into this and we should we should start to tell these stories and we should talk to and reach out and work with these influencers. Again, they could be micro influencers, they could be A-less talent. Um, and we'll lean into that because they use us and, and we're able to bring their restaurants to them and everything else to them every single day. And so for us, it was it was a very, you know, it was a very, very clear path to leaning into using that and working with them on the marketing side of the house because. It just made sense, right? They were doing it every day. We didn't have to approach it and we don't have to approach it in a way where we are seeking somebody to, to throw kind of a bunch of money at and have them be a paid spokesperson, but maybe they don't even use the platform. We don't, we don't, have, to, we don't have to fight against that because they use us and we're, we're so prominent across LA specifically. Um, and so we lead into it. You know, I think it stems in LA, but really it goes across the US. You know, when we tell stories about you know, you name it, John Legend, Katy Perry, Sean Mendez, using our platform and what their order history is and, you know, some of the fun stuff that we do with them, uh, people love it and they love it no matter where they are in the U.S. And so it just became something that was very authentic and made a lot of sense for us to lean into and we continue to lean into it. I love that. You're right. It's just to see kind of what is Katy Perry ordering or any of these celebrities, it almost brings them to a more obtainable, kind of relatable person. Like, oh my gosh, I've been there. I love that, that yeah. plate too. So yeah, it absolutely. kind of blurs the lines between who you're, everybody loves a seat at the table at these restaurants, no matter who you are. And so I think that's really great, but also leveraging your micro influencers to our diehard customers and, you know, want to chat try all the different foods in LA and across the world. It's good to see that you've been sharing those plates and those stories as well. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Sarah, I'd love to hear from you about G&E. Yes, kind of similar to what everyone's saying, um, influencer marketing isn't new at GE. Um, you know, we have a long sort of history. We've always sort of uh, embedded our brand and our brand storytelling into various communities. But what is interesting is uh, who influences our customers has definitely changed over time and kind of accelerated through COVID. So historically, you know, the great thing about GE, we've got this fantastic cutting edge, world-class technology. You know, we're building kind of wind turbines um, offshore that are, you know, 230 meters long. Guillaume knows what I'm talking about. He also... Uh, He's also in meters, that's about, you know, 850 feet tall. Um, so we've always had influencers who want to come and kind of um, see that it's spectacular uh, and be around our technology. But through COVID, our influencer strategy has actually changed and become very much more kind of internal. We use our employees as our biggest influencers to Stephen's point that they're, they're the ones who kind of influence our end customer. Uh, and during COVID, where a, a lot of us were sort of fortunate enough, you can see I'm um, sheltering at home, uh, a lot of our employees in GE are frontline workers. They're going in uh, to our factories, uh, you know, they accelerated sort of production of ventilators. They were going out to our customers, um, delivering medical devices, 
powering grids. Um, so we've actually changed um, uh, recently our kind of uh, how, who we see as an influencer and, and using our employees has been, um, has been highly sort of engaging uh, for us to get, uh, to, get to our end, end customers. That's amazing. I don't hear that too often, hearing that, you know, using your employees as influencers. Sometimes when you think of an influencer, you think of someone that's on Instagram or, but it's just, you have a really great point here. Everybody is influential in some way of capacity, whether that be an employee, a customer, um, an actress, we all have influence. And so how do we leverage that to tell your customer or your brand story, which is very fascinating. Thanks, Sarah. Guillaume, I'd love to hear from you around MasterCard. Yeah, sure. Um, I really like the way you, you framed the, the question earlier on. Um, I think that for forever, brands have been associating with uh, influential uh, celebrities. So I think we were all doing influential marketing before it was called influential marketing in, in, in a way. Um, and especially us at MasterCard, where a big, big part of our marketing strategy is centered around passions and sponsorships. Um, so we've always partners with uh, A-list celebrities since even before the internet existed. So we didn't come to influencer marketing as a fresh new thing. We, we just followed our influencers and, and, and went with them in, in, and in when they morphed towards more social entities. So we basically adapted the, the way we work with them. We, we made sure we provided content that they could share on all the platforms, um, with different types of influencers, uh, it's true. Um, I mean, because also of the, the nature of our sponsorship, so we are, we are starting to get bigger on gaming, for instance, and the type of influencers that you have in, in these environments are very, very different. Um, uh, they're on Twitch, they behave very differently. Um, um, and also um, in music, I mean, we, we partner with YouTubers and so on, but the, the dynamics is the same than 30, 40 years ago. You, you want to partner with people who have influence, credibility, and, and that people, uh, people uh, look up to. So it, in a way, it's, it's been more of a, of a transition than a, uh, a new start or something brand new. That's great. Yeah, that's a really, really great point. You know, I'm, cu I'm curious to see from the group here, you know, starting with influencer marketing. I remember back when it was just becoming a thing as far as uh, it was an influencer, like with celebrities, but when we started to consider a different type of influential person, it was a little bit tough to get started um, because, you know, brands want a imagery to look a certain way and polished and have this kind of aesthetic. And we found that after time, the influencer generated content or even user generated content was performing the best on our social channels. And so we were able to make a case at Williams Sonoma where I was there for a few years to say, hey, this is very effective. Although we have incredible imagery in our catalogs, this is making it more obtainable and relatable. So I'd love to hear if, you know, was it a challenge to start with influencer marketing when you started started to approach that and I'm assuming now that that has changed, but I'd love to kind of hear your story as you've uh, started to activate influencers. Um, Anyone can yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I'll take that if, if you don't mind. Uh, yes, it's, it's, been, it's been difficult. Um, uh, it's, it's, we had to learn to, to release control. Um, and uh, as a brand, uh, it's not a, a, an easy thing to do. Um, so we went through a lot of iteration. We, 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 we were too controlling at the beginning. Um, and then after, uh, we, we, we basically delegated too much. Um, I think what we've learned over time is, is um, you basically need to invest a lot in the relationship. Uh, you need to invest a lot of time. Um, I think the first thing is to understand the motivation of the influencers. Um, and, and you can tell by building this relationship, you can see whether they're just here for a quick bucks or whether they are interested in building content um, uh, with, with, with your brand and with the, with the territory you want to communicate on. Um, and and you, you really have to spend a lot of time explaining what we have to achieve and, and see where our two universes meet and what we could do together. Um, 
so there's, there's a lot of things you can outsource in influencer management, but this, this, this relationship building aspect, these briefing aspects, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, it's, it's something you have to do yourself and you have to invest a lot on a lot of time on. Um, I think that's what we, we've learned over time. I, I don't know if the rest of the group felt the same way. Yeah, I can jump in for Postmates. I think, yeah, I think you do. There's, there's a group for us, there's a group of, of influencers where we do invest that time and we do have um, these recurring relationships where we're constantly doing things together and, and we love that. The other thing and the other side of that that we lean into a lot is just that there's, there's a lot of food content. We're fortunate in that people love to create content around food and we're sort of at this intersection of food technology and culture. And so it creates these really amazing moments of when Postmates is able to deliver something really amazing into your home, especially if you think of the past seven or eight months that we've all been in, um, Postmates is able to do that. And so we see organically a ton of content being created. So for those, those maybe influencers that we're not having this recurring relationship with, we're actually reaching out and saying, hey, TikTok's a great example. You know, we're using our TikTok and simply sharing the content that TikTok influencers are creating around Postmates and food. And so I think just as much as identifying those influencers that you want to work with, I think there's also an opportunity to more organically look at content that's out there and content that's being created and lean into that content and give yourself as a platform, you know, our own platform, a place for that content to shine because people are doing it authentically. And it's something that we love seeing and we love doing because there's some of the stuff that we see that we couldn't even script, right? Like these are things that people are just bringing into their home and we love it. And so leaning into that, I think is equally as important. It's a yeah, really I think good it's, point. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, yeah, I think it's so tempting to you want that control and to have these sort of glossy images. We'd have taken such this sort of architectural digest approach to our imagery and sort of in contrast then sort of let it roll with our with our influencers. But I think appreciating that they are truly sort of creative experts in content creation and let them do their thing, doing the research, making sure it's a fit for your brand. But the more restraints you put on them, the more it's gonna look scripted and the more no one's gonna really sort of believe it and connect with the content. So it is, um, it is important you have that trusting relationship, but you kind of have to let them do their thing or it's not going to come through in a in a way that is meaningful it's, it's a really great point that we i think when you when you talk about where it kind of started versus where we are now at least it's it's less about going out and getting a bunch of people to start something new and it's more about trying to harness the power of what's already happening to eric's point it's like if you think about um uh if you think about the example of BravoCon, for example um, BravoCon was the first time it launched last year, and it was a big in-person event for fans of Bravo celebrities and of all things Bravo. And what that did is it not only gave a platform to these influencers that are on-air influencers, but it also set up an opportunity for to, to empower or supercharge the fans themselves of these shows to also be influencers themselves with creating like creating organic content opportunities and things for them to shoot and things for them to react to and letting them meet their favorite Bravo celebrities and all of that. So when we think about when we think about how to uh, harness the power of this super tanker of influencers that we have at NBC Universal, it's about both enabling uh, those really authentic and organic uh, connections and tapping into things that already exist, as well as creating opportunities to really empower and um, uh, uh, use leverage the fans themselves to help um, help uh, uh, back those stories. I think that's all great insights. And you guys are saying so many great buzzwords here that I'm noticing, you know, you're, you're talking about an influence as a creator and that they are, you know, they're an expert at this. And so it's almost like giving them the trust that you've built a community of followers based on your lifestyle, based on the quality of your content. So I'm going to work with you and trust in you that you're going to create content that's going to be relevant to that following versus making sure that it always is in line with your actual brand. Like, oh, we would never post that. That's okay, actually. You don't, you don't need them to always post the content that your brand would post. You want other different angles that people see and perceive your brand as, and then you kind of open up this net of new customers, new viewers, um, just so that you are 
impacting, creating an impactful community, which is really great. I think the more you know, flexibility you give creators, the po more powerful it can be. Um, but there is something, you know, bringing it back down to, all right, how do you report on this? And I think this is something I'm seeing at Aspire IQ that's becoming more and more important for brands is saying, what is the way, how do we measure success in this? Um, what is the right way to do that? And, you know, what are those measurements that I should be talking to? So I'm curious, you know, when you see you've done a campaign with your brand and you go back to your team to say, this was a success, I'd love to hear how each one of you are, um, you know, making sure that that is a success and how you define that. I, I could jump in again to, to start this off. I think that it's it's an interesting question, but it's also a complex question because if you think of if you think of your influencer strategy as something separate from your core marketing strategy with its own metrics that you're monitoring success for, then I think it's disconnected from what really matters. So if you ask me specifically for Postmates and for what we're doing, what does success look like? I would say that when we lean into influencer programs and campaigns that they drive outsize or incremental growth of delivery volume on the platform. And, and inherently to do that, that means that they get more engagement than let's say a non-influencer piece of content. But I think every, what I would say is no matter how small or large you are as a brand, you have to ask yourself what your core metrics that you're trying to um, achieve are, what the impact that you want to achieve as a business is, um, and then make sure that the influencer campaign ladders up to that. So this answer should be very different for every organization, right? Because nobody else, I don't think, and nobody else on this call is aiming to drive food volume or, or delivery volume every night, right? So mine is delivery volume. But if we asked everyone on, on the, the um, panel today, they should have a very different answer that ladders up to whatever their key goals are for, for, for their brand and for the organization. Yeah, and for us, it's, it's really about making sure that it's a win for all parties involved. I think the KPIs will totally change depending on what brand we're working for, whether that's actually moving products off shelves or if it's an impact and awareness play, if it's some sort of uh, social good alignment, whatever that might be, it's, it's always different. But um, when we're working with influencers or talent specifically, what we're trying to do is make sure that it's not only a win for the audiences that are consuming whatever content or whatever program is that we're working on with the influencer, it's also a win win for the influencer themselves because it feels like it's authentic, it feels like it's content, it feels like it's, it's coming from them. And then for us as a company too, obviously that uh, there's a win for the company and being able to connect the brands in this way. Um, uh, that everybody's happy. So it's it's a little bit of like the win 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 trifecta to make sure that it's like it's successful for everybody involved. Yeah, I can't agree more with uh, Eric. Oh, sorry, uh, Jim. Oh, sorry, you go. Yeah. You go. I was I was just going to say we're aligned with Eric, where um, our ROI is is tied to our overall brand KPIs and. Uh, so for us at GE, we're more interested in engagement and sort of positive uh, sentiment uh, in terms of our brand reputation. And with using in, uh, employees, we also have internal KPIs around uh, employee engagement, which is interesting as well. Yeah, I mean, um, our brand metrics are more around, um, sorry, our marketing objectives and KPIs are more around brand preference which is of course much more intangible and much more difficult to, to measure. So it's always difficult for us to, to allocate a, a specific uh, uh, KPI or metric to, to uh, an influencer campaign. Um, we, we use engagement as a, as a proxy to, to understand whether the activity is, is getting traction. Um, without getting too technical, uh, there are still limitations around calculating reach with influencers, which to me is, a, is an issue. Um, all of the controversy around followers and fake followers and the ability to, to measure reach, I, I don't think have been sorted. And it's, 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 it's still something I think that's um, a roadblock for, for, for more investment. Um, so I think we're, we're doing pretty much the same as everyone else is, is we're using engagement metrics as a proxy for measuring something bigger, something uh, a bit more complex to measure. 
And, and I'd also add, in addition to some of the engagement and around and, and the awareness opportunity that comes from whether it's a brand campaign or a promotion or, or an offer or for us, a launch of a new hotel or restaurant, there's also an element which is becoming increasingly more important now around cost savings and the ability for you to sort of execute in a much more dynamic and timely way on some campaigns um, in a much more cost effective way. We're in the hotel industry. It's a very exciting time right now. Um, and uh, and so for our properties, you know, that are that are dealing with, you know, different challenges in their markets for us to be able to partner with influencers and perhaps um, drive some more awareness for their property um, at a much more cost effective way than a, a big brand campaign or a big photo shoot, which can cost, you know, upwards of hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more. Can you do that on a much more cost effective basis and really drive some awareness around the Rowan in Palm Springs doing a dining under the stars, um, you know, dinner campaign and promotion. And all of a sudden you've got all your locals in house. So I think there's that element as well that um, allows us to not sort of get stuck in the mud, particularly during some challenging times. Thanks Kathleen. Yeah, I think this is all interesting and it kind of hit the, the point on the, the nail on the head here. There's not one size fits all of how you measure successful influencer programs. And I wanted everyone listening here to hear that because it really comes down to how are you wanting to use the influencer and, and this can go a hundred different ways. So whether that be cost saving, whether that be, you know, instead of a big production, it could be I have influencers on the ground creating that for me at lower cost. It could be the number of pieces of content to fuel your social channels. It could be the amount of engagement. It could be reach. It could be just overall sentiment around your product. So I think it, there's lots of different opportunities and it's really great to see that you're each doing something different. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, talking about a real life case say, case scenario, what has been something recently that you've done with influencers that have been, that has been successful, whether that be, you know, new way that you're leveraging influencers through COVID-19, like you mentioned, Kathleen, um, or any new product offerings that you thought, wow, this is really great. I'm going to continue to invest in influencer marketing. I'll jump in. Okay, I was like, don't jump in at all, guys. Uh -oh. I know. <laughs> um, well, one of the things we launched last year, our Stay Human campaign, um, Kimpton's always had a very, recognized as having a very heartfelt approach to, to guest care and, and the engagement and the relationship that our employees really build with our guests. And so not only do we partner with, with some of our employees, but we also partnered with um, a number of photographers. So we did a partnership with Photographiska we brought these photographers in um, and they did their own interpretation of what stay human means to them. So again, they had a sort of a blank canvas for them to represent that. And we saw a real diversity in how that came through, launched um, a photo gallery um, pop up at our Hotel Aventi and at Photographiska's launch in New York. Um, and so again, using photographers as influencers and extending our reach through them using their content and then pulling that through into the physical spaces of our properties. We hadn't done anything like that before. Paused a little bit um, mid stride in, in COVID. We'll bring that back um, once it becomes safe to do so. It's now in, in at the Epic in Miami, but that was a really cool way for us to bring that together and, and, and working with photographers more extensively. So we um, launched a campaign in September, as I was saying, sort of. Uh, after the sort of initial kind of surge of, of COVID uh, purely centered around our using our employees as influencers. It was called G Gets to Work. It um, showcased 24 employees in 24 locations in 24 hours. So there's a creative hook. Um, and really, uh, you know, um, our employees um, kind of showcased uh, what it's like to work in GE, what they're working on, uh, like I say, sort of delivering medical uh, devices to remote parts of um, Alaska in California, um, uh, working on, you know, super uh, high speed jet engines, uh, wind turbines uh, in Europe. So, um, yeah, we've just finished that campaign and um, it was really exciting to, to bring to life. I can share one that we did actually at the beginning of COVID. We had an interesting 
situation in front of us, I guess, that we've all had, all had something, I guess, over the past eight or nine months challenge to deal with. But one of the things that we saw was that we became a lifeline to these small businesses. So you had these small restaurants that had to shut their doors almost overnight that had no way to get food to the customer, maybe because they didn't have a pickup kind of uh, uh, scenario in place and they didn't have technology in place to do pickup, but definitely they couldn't have people in the restaurant. And so we knew that we needed to lean into the fact and um, showcase these small restaurants um, and do it in a way that would help them drive business and just help them continue to stay afloat during COVID. And this was at the very beginning. And so on the influencer side, and this actually went up to kind of top tier celebrity, but what we did is we, we reached out to some of these amazing A-list talent that use Postmates all the time. And we said, can you do one thing for us? Get your, get your phone, do a quick video, and just tell us what your favorite local restaurant is um, and ask people to go and support that local business. And so it was that simple. We got a bunch of these videos in, and this all happened within two weeks, which you know is crazy with that level of, of talent. We got these videos in, and it was funny because a lot of them were, I love ordering you know, whatever restaurant on Postmates, and Postmates has been able to bring that to me. And we cut out all Postmates because we wanted this to be about the small restaurant and the small business and ordering local. And, and that's what we called the campaign. And so we cut this together. Um, we had, uh, you know, Katy Perry, John Legend, I mentioned earlier, um, Megan Rapino, Snoop Dogg, Shawn, Shawn Mendes, this really great talent calling out their favorite local restaurants, the taco shop down the street, the, you know, uh, Katy, I think Katy Perry was talking about how she loves Impossible Burger, I think it was. But it was amazing because they were calling out these restaurants we put that together and then we put a bunch of media behind it and had nothing about Postmates, nothing about delivery. We simply said, now's the time that your local restaurants need you, order local, help your favorite restaurants and keep them afloat. And that was that's one of my favorite campaigns where it was, I mean, talk about authenticity. It just connected all the dots. And I think it was something that we saw great success with. Uh, I can share another story of, of COVID uh, adaptation, if you want. But um, it, I mean, we, we have a, a platform at MasterCard called Priceless.com, which basically provide um, money can buy experiences. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a very important tool for, for our banks, for our issuers, uh, providing value to their, to their cardholders. And it was a, most of the experiences were travel related, restaurants, um, leisure, uh, uh, shows, etc. And of course, we had to completely change the, the, the content overnight. Um, and we basically moved towards uh, uh, virtual experiences. Um, and the, the way we did that is, is, is through influencers. That, that was the way of creating these experiences and making people want um, to interact with, with, with the platform. So we did um, plenty of um, uh, private sessions, uh, uh, golf lessons with PGA stars, uh, cooking classes with celebrity chefs, singing lessons. And we basically had to mobilize all our, our influencers and, and ambassadors to, to create content uh, very quickly and they responded very well. Um, they also happen to have time on their end and, and wanting to do, to do stuff. So um, we, we've been able to turn this, this completely, complete change of strategy fairly quickly. And the, the, um, the social aspects of it, we, we created some virality that we didn't have with physical experiences. Um, so it was a, a very interesting shift. I would say one of the ones that uh, we worked on recently that comes to mind is um, we did a project with Wayfair um, and it started back in the fall, but they were essentially launching a new brand campaign uh, in February. And what they had, had identified is they'd identified their target audience. They had this demographic um, psychographic profile for this person that uh, they were trying to reach. And as part of their research, Search, they also had identified that Kelly Clarkson would be the perfect influencer to be like to launch this brand new brand campaign. 
Um, and, and, and what we did is we, they came to NBC universal for two things. They came to us to land a bigger deal with Kelly because we had, we were working with Kelly already on the voice. Um, Kelly was in the middle of, uh, about, uh, or about to start launching her new daytime show. Um, so they came to us and they said, as part of our partnership with you, we also want to try to land this bigger deal with Kelly Clarkson to help us launch our brand campaign. And what happened from there is uh, we very quickly went into a co-creative development process with the Wayfair team uh, to, to match up both what the brand was trying to achieve and then what, what we knew was authentic and real to Kelly Clarkson, having worked with Kelly on several different programs. And so we actually went up to the Wayfair offices, the creative team did, we met with them, we had a whole day long creative brainstorm session, uh, co-developed some, uh, some, some concepts to take back to Kelly's team. And then we went into Kelly's team very early and said, look, this is what we're trying to do as a brand. This is, these are some creative concepts. What do you think we'd love to, uh, we'd love to, we'd love to close out this deal. Um, and, and what happened was not only was Kelly excited by and um, energized by the, the, the creative, uh, that she felt like it was authentic to her. And ultimately she did become the, the, the brand uh, spokesperson for their new campaign. Um, it, she was so excited about it that she also um, uh, partnered with them to launch her own line on Wayfair, uh, which has been a huge success for them. And so I think I think the learning from that concept is that we we to be, on the brand side, getting the, the influencer into those conversations and upstreaming those them in those creative conversations early is going to make the, the end deal making much, much easier on the back side of it. But in addition to that, what I would say is that knowing those those influencers as we do um, and being able to activate them really quickly and, and close out those deals. Um, when COVID did hit uh, uh, and started to peak, uh, the company came to us as well as um, the ad council came to us to see how could we launch an information campaign uh, for, um, uh, for awareness around what to do during COVID. And so uh, within the first week of everybody working from home, we were working with our influencers across the whole company to basically create a The More You Know campaign around washing your hands and staying socially distanced and testing and, and all of that, uh, that, that went out, I think two weeks after it started. And so the scalability of a longer lead project like a Kelly Clarkson is, is one thing to, to be able to have, uh, that we're able to do. But then in addition to that, um, knowing the talent and uh, one of the big goals we have is access and ease of access and speed and agility and all that, um, that that's seen in what we were able to accomplish very quickly with the more you know and, and the COVID campaign. Wow, all these are so inspirational. I'm like, oh my gosh, such great ideas, you guys. This is really amazing, impactful storytelling from the Postmates stories that gave me goosebumps, Eric, um, to, to Zara, you know, talking to her employees and, and Gam, how, you know, that's really helped help with their services. I think, you know, I have so many other questions, but we only have so much time. Um, but I, I'd love to hear, you know, for everyone listening in today, you know, as we approach the holidays, can you believe it? We're here in Q4. If they are activating influencers for the holidays or even the new year, what would be maybe your piece of advice when thinking about the best way to work with influencers, um, you know, for a story storytelling campaign? Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit, maybe like what's your plans for the holidays? Um, but yeah, just any pieces of advice work, when to work with influencers and how to even scale out your campaigns. I think Stephen started off the sort of whole conversation with some great advice around uh, authenticity. Um, so don't do it just because it's the holidays, but you know, find an authentic way to engage with communities, either new or existing, um, around, around telling the, the brand stories that you wanna get out there. That would be my one piece of advice. Um, I will follow with a, a very basic and obvious piece of advice, which is that your your consumers, your, your, your customers, if you're in B2B, um, are your most important influencers. Uh, and that's why I, I like the um, strategy from Postmates and Eric so much, because essentially what these celebrities are, are is very happy customers. Um, and um, I think this is extremely clever. Um, and But we should all, all think that way. We should... Um, uh, be focusing on creating very happy consumers who then uh, get to talk about us.
Yeah, I would think about, um, you know, what is it that your your customers are most excited about in going into the holiday season and what are they most anxious about and how do you then navigate that um, and perhaps select influencers to inspire people to maybe book their travel for us or buy your product for next year or maybe make, reinsure, reinsure that things can be safe and you can travel safely in, in, in my case. So we're constantly thinking about what's going through their minds right now. Are their kids in school or are they out of school? <laughs> are they going inside and not able to celebrate outside anymore? You know, kind of what's going on. So um, we're, we're thinking about that sort of psychological and the sort of the emotional needs of our guests and making sure that we're, we're aligned. It's changed from how they felt in June versus September. And then as they go into the, the holiday season, um, maybe or maybe not spending time with family and friends, et cetera, as things spike and, and um, the dynamics are going to really change. I think it's it's it play, that plays into what Eric was saying or what it, you Eric you did at Postmates too, which is uh, really important when working with influencers. Which is the people engage with influencers for a specific thing. Like people are scrolling through their feeds, they like them for what the content that they post. Um, they, it feels aspirational to them or comforting to them or whatever else that might be. Um, but they're also like having a, what they consider to be a human to human interaction. Right. And I think that understanding what's happening in the world, particularly in such a chaotic time is really important because the, everybody's going through a different version of what we're all going through right now together. And, and as you're looking specifically at the holidays and even moving into the new year, depending on what the state of, of, the, of the world is, I think that um, uh, working with influencers to engage those audiences in a way that recognizes what that is, is going to be really important. It, it plays into the idea of authenticity, but it's also about timeliness and being able to tap into influencers for a, a timely message that feels good to uh, those audiences. And I, I agree with with all of everything that you've all said. I think those are those are great points. Authenticity is my number one, Zara. I couldn't agree with you more. And what I would say though is have fun with it. You know, the times are trying and they're challenging. And to your point, see, we're all going through the same types of things, but in different ways. Um, but have fun with it. Order local was fun. You know, it was it was terrible to be facing what we were facing as a country and as a world, as a, as a global community. Um, but we knew that we needed to at least lean into something that gave positivity and hope and joy to people. And so, you know, as marketers, we have the opportunity to do that. And as influencers, we have the opportunity or they have the opportunity to scale that. And so have fun, bring joy, don't get caught in the rut that has been 2020. Um, because there is there is positivity there and there is goodness on the horizon. So I would just say don't don't forget about that. Great point, Eric. I love all that. Oh, sorry, did you want to include something? Go ahead. I was going to say, Eric, that's going to be my mantra as I go to sleep for the next nine weeks of uh, 2020. <laughs> yeah, it is, it's mine for sure. Yeah, one thing that you did, you all mentioned, um, you know, thinking about the holidays or what's ahead of us or, you know, continue to have fun with it, continue to test, keep pushing yourselves as brands. Um, one thing to do that, that was mentioned earlier was relationships with these creators and long-term partnerships, not just for a quick post or a quick transaction. Um, and I'm seeing this more across all the industries at Aspire IQ is that this long-term partnership is very top of mind. And I think I'm seeing, I'm going to see a lot more of this, um, in 2021. I'm curious to see, like, how have you been developing relationships that, you know, I've, you've mentioned Steven, you know, where you were talking with one, you know, celebrity and that took a lot of work, but how do you do this with influencers at scale or how have you done this? Are you doing loyalty programs? Are you doing like, hey, you don't need to post, but you know, here's something from us just to show you that we appreciate you and being a part of the community. I'd love to hear something of that because I think that will set up our, our listeners up for success in 2021 when thinking about activating influencers for long-term partnerships. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit of a of a trade-off, um, you, you can't have a deep relationship with many people. Um, so you mentioned scale, so it's, it's, it depends how you look at it. I mean, you, you, you're better off partnering with one influencer that has clout and a big following. I mean, that's the way of, of, of getting 
um, of getting scale and, and building this deep relationship with this one individual will, will probably go a longer way than onboarding um, 200 micro influencers with a very transactional incentive program. Um, I mean, depends on your objectives. It depends what you're trying to, uh, to achieve. That might not be a, a universal truth, but, but for us, that's, um, that's the way we, we go about it. It's to really identify really trusted ind individuals um, who, who have a, a already the scale and invest in the, in the relationship. I think for us that scalability is really important. Um, and the way that we do that is because we have we like we have our own influencer network with the talent that we work with uh, on the programming side. Um, and what we what we've worked to do with this talent room capability that we've launched um, is to identify if you're looking to reach um, an audience that is interested in food, here are the 10 food influencers across the NBC Universal um, um, uh, portfolio that would make sense for you to get that scale. So it's not like just a one-off deal. Again, obviously like somebody like a Kelly Clarkson is more about broad impact and, and broad mass appeal um, uh, for, for specific audiences. But if you're looking to do food, if you're looking to do somebody who has some sort of social cause, if you're looking for people in the portfolio that have pets, like we've, we've basically gone through the list of everybody that we, we can work with and, and categorize them on things that we know clients might be looking for to try to provide an easy scalable solution uh, for, for however they would wanna work with an influencer across our portfolio. Oh, Kathleen, were you going to add something? I saw you unmute yourself. Oh, yeah, I did. I um, yeah, I think I think there's sort of this balance, right? We have we have long-term relationships with some influencers that can really speak to a variety of different areas, or maybe they're just experts in, in a destination, so we can lean on them for fresh content from that single destination. Um, but I think wanting to make sure that you mentioned agile and speed to market and um, and moving quickly here, and I think now more than ever, just trying to stay as proactive as possible. You just wanna make sure you've got the ability to be flexible and, and dynamic with the campaign, right? What, based on the need and, and what you're going after. And so influencers have expertise in, in you know, certain areas. And so wanna make sure that that, can, um, that that can work for you and you're not sort of stuck with a handful of tried and true and you know, you'll, you'll sort of like your stock portfolio diversify. <laughs> No, that's great. We I've seen brands from industry to CPG to food companies that they are building more of a, a robust community that they can quickly right. activate. So for these members at you know these members are during COVID nineteen and we had to transit you know transition and pivot our strategies. These are people we could call on quickly yeah. versus oh, this is our first time to talk to you. Here's what we're hoping to get from you. We already know that they understand what we're doing as a brand and they are maybe a customer that we found from social listening or that they've partnered with them before. So this has just been a really, really great way to scale out you know, campaigns when you're moving quickly. Um, and this takes time. It takes loyalty on, on the, the customer side, but it also takes loyalty on the brand side to continue to add value um, where, hey, we, again, we want to send you something from us or, you know, hey, just a note, wishing you a happy holidays. Thanks for all of your incredible creative work with the brand this year. Just things like that, that the influencer doesn't feel like it's a transactional thing and, oh, they only just use me when they need me. It's I feel like I'm a part of, you know, the Postmate community, or I feel like I'm a part of, you know, different, different programs. So I think it's been really something that I've, I've uh, identified at Aspire IQ, seeing more and more of these community programs. Yeah, I just had an example. It just struck me, you know, I think your customers are changing now too, because they're going through different stresses. So all of a sudden, if, as we're looking at how we fill a city hotel Monday through Thursday, it used to be business travelers, maybe not as many, all of a sudden we're trying to attract families and saying, look, your kids are in virtual school. You can come stay with us, work from the hotel, go to school. Well, now, so now we have families that are influencers that are talking about how they're working from our hotels during the school week. So that is just a whole different world of, 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 of customers that we're, we're now going after. So that I think has been interesting. 
Very awesome. Well, thank you so much, you guys, for spending the, the morning, afternoon uh, with me talking about what you guys are doing as far as influencer marketing, how it's evolved. It's been really, really interesting to hear your own brand story and how you know influencer marketing has become a key component of your overall marketing objective. So thank you so much. And thank you for everyone that attended and tuned in today. You can check out more information on these fabulous folks um, on their LinkedIn and follow them. I'm sure they're all influencers too, right? Um, so thank you so much. It was a pleasure to meet all of you and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.